Who's Mary Lou? Hey, Mary Lou. Hey, uh. Hello, and how are you all? Hello, darling. How are you? Very well. Okay, good, thank you. And we're live. Beautiful. Now that shirt is very special, Steve. That's that's very special. I hope people put some comments about Steve's shirt, please. It's, it's very Romeo and Juliet, I reckon. Okay. I just need a gun. And uh, obviously, you know, the film version. I don't, I don't read books as an English teacher. <laughs> I I will I, I will throw you out. <laughs> yeah. I'll I'll show you the graphic novel version of Romeo and Juliet and then I don't know, save, Romeo save and Juliet. years of our life. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so everyone's here. And if you're all okay, we may actually set this off on time. Very exciting. Uh, it is for me. You have no idea how much of a relief it is. Uh, and so we are looking at connecting globally and leading remotely. Educators on the front line. So good afternoon. Um, I do believe the tech is working and that we're streaming through YouTube and that all is well. Um, before I introduce the amazing panelists, I'd like you to meet Nikki, who is going to be monitoring the chat over on Hi, uh, YouTube. Um, so if you have any questions for the panellists, um, you can put them in the chat and Nikki will keep us informed about those. Very good. I would also like to thank Kelly Hutchinson for creating such a fantastic event and making room for us to bring the voices of educators into the discussion of where we go next. Uh, I would like first, of course, to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet. For me, that is the Wur Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and I pay my respects to their elders, past, present, and emerging. 2020 will be a year to remember, but how it is remembered will be very much up to us. A word that's often bandied about, certainly in education, is disruption. While no one denies that some of the disruption is hard to take, disruption is often required if we want to change direction or make and adopt new ways of seeing and doing. We've learned so much during these last few months and if there is a challenge, it will be to ensure we don't go back to broken systems that weren't working. Our four panelists this afternoon share a vision for what education can be in the future, and they are all actively working to make it so. Um, I would, I could say lots about them, but I'll make it brief and then pass you over to them. Adriano De Prato is a long-term supporter of dynamic learning systems and the learning architect of the Polaris ecosystem. He's a partner in a school for tomorrow and co-host of the Game Changers podcast. Mary Lou O'Brien has an extensive background in digital transformation, and earlier this year, she set up her education consultancy, which allows her to work for schools internationally. Lauren Sayer has extensive global ex expertise in the education sector. She's designed professional learning programs that help teachers implement digital technologies. And Stephen Colbert, as Colbert, as well as having a full-time teaching position, Stephen leads two digital professional learning networks, is exec executive secretary of Teachers Without Borders, and is committed to improving education globally. So perhaps if each of you could start by telling us a little about bit about what you want to see happen in education as we move through this very bizarre year. Um, so, Adriano, would you like to start and then sure. and pass it to somebody else? Okay. Well, Carolyn, first of all, thank you very much for uh, organising this particular uh, gathering of 
uh, such uh, wonderful uh, in, in people. I, I feel like a bit of an imposter amongst the, the my wonderful colleagues of Steve, Mary Lou and, and, and Lauren. So uh, we'll, I'll, I'll do my best to kind of force my way through the idea of globally collecting and, and, and learning remotely, but particularly to you, Carolyn, uh, you've done the power amount of work to ensure that uh, the involvement during the DIF has been one that engages so many individuals in education. And uh, I applaud you for, for um, coordinating this and I know it's no easy feat to put something like this together, particularly when technology is involved. Ironically, that's what we're talking about here today. Uh, so I'll get, I'll get straight into it. So uh, I'm just going to get everyone to humour me for a little bit. As you know, I'm just going to go on a bit of a rant here and then I'm going to hand it over to my, my colleagues who are no doubt going to pick it apart and actually make sense of it much more than I will. So the first thing I want to start with is that what's been really powerful during this time is that we've actually engaged in many, many rich conversations with colleagues around the world about what is actually happening in education in response to, to COVID-19. What we are learning so much about is our capacity as a profession to respond to a situation of crisis in such a constructive and effective manner. What seemed impossible or undesirable just months ago is now the kind of new normal. And I don't like really using that phrase too much, but that's the reality. And we are now taking away from this experience new competencies, our knowledge, our skills, our dispositions, and particularly our learning habits around changing because the reality is we have to. Out of a situation of necessity that is arising in response to an undeniable state of disruption and human suffering, the truth is we're all changing. And it's really, really pronounced. We are also learning about the challenges namely around what I believe is the true pandemic, and that is around the digital divide, a serious issue that requires a community and broader system solution. And we shouldn't downplay this kind of real inequity issue. Nonetheless, of course, we are here to kind of talk about learning remotely. Our times, as I said, are, 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 are characterised by unprecedented volume, pace and intensity of an exchange of ideas and culture in a technologically rich ecosystem of global connection and citizenship. And as educators, what I've noticed is that we need to start preparing our students to graduate from school with these adaptive expertise, skills and self-efficacy to learn, to lead, to live and to work with success. It is then timely for us to consider this notion of globally connecting and learning remotely for schools. So much of what is happening in our schools and our learning communities right now is drawing upon the deep knowledge of the great educators, and we have three of them with us today, uh, about what sustains and nurtures effective learning communities regardless of the circumstances that people find themselves in. This, this kind of notion of the old story of grafting new ideas to, to old structures just simply doesn't cut it anymore. Our new story needs to be one of real and unabiding presence of continuous change. We need to identify those traditions and values that stand us in really good stead along the way, but we also need to recognise that our default position to the status quo means that if we stay in that space, we're going to be left behind. Part of the notion of leading through the crisis we have learned is that we're simply migrating schooling and timetabling as we have become accustomed to it from one medium to another is simply not sustainable in this kind of notion of a next norm. To do learning differently, we actually have to, in fact, simply do learning differently. Even when the changes that bring us makes us uncomfortable, or even tired. And my belief is that as our role to prepare students to thrive in this new world, then we need to prepare them to adapt in a way that we organise the time and the space in which we co-create the learning of our students by allowing them to articulate, to reflect and to explore their character, to explore their competency, to explore their, their wellness, that we should be modelling, scaffolding and coaching. And what a great opportunity we have to incorporate blended learning. When the conditions of learning is the premise of change, then we must change the way we deliver it. And the Illinois Board of Education have developed a series of guidelines that are a good example of this. Online learning requires us different ways to plan for concentration, for attention of students at all different ages. And schools everywhere are showing us that student voice and agency are much more relevant, meaningful, and therefore empowering than anything around teacher control in or out of a remote learning context. So during this kind of unprecedented time, some educators who have found, who have probably spent much of their previous decade resisting the idea of embedding technology in learning, have been recognising that technology as is in fact a powerful tool to connect with purpose. They are gaining mastery over this tool in ways that might have not been imagined and their professional autonomy is being enhanced, not diminished through its use. And what I'm seeing is that schools are supporting 
uh, a lovely balance between synchronous and asynchronous delivery models. And asynchronous learning provides us the much needed flexibility th that better meets the needs of both the students and the teachers by relinquishing the familiarity of the rigidity of the school and kind of supports this idea of both independent and collaborative type of work. So I'm just going to finish by saying it's not surprising that there are many schools that are considering or proceeding with a powerful blended model of continuous learning that incorporates a variety of pedagogies uh, from direct instruction all the way through to collaborative problem solving to independent investigation like pedagogy. And, and the reality is this, we need to think about if we're going to really connect globally and learn remotely, we need to also think about how this kind of continuous learning model can be different by leveraging the importance of the character apprenticeship that's offered by the teacher. They still have a crucial role to play in this. Also, the social exchange that often happens on campus. We can't diminish the value of an on-campus experience, but the best structures of self-paced, self-determined learning can definitely arise from an online in-context or in-country opportunity. I'm gonna stop there so I catch my breath and I might hand it over to uh, Mary Lou. Thank you, Adriano. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some overlap there, but here goes. <laughs> so what I'm really interested in is the digital technology space and digital technology being deployed to support not only learning, but the tools enabling educators to connect, learn from one another and support one another on a global scale. We're seeing global and virtual staff rooms popping up on Twitter and schools are trying digital tools that have been in their toolkit for years, but they just haven't been deployed before. And mostly that was because uh, staff didn't have the confidence to try the new tools, or often they just didn't feel they were necessary. Schools are now willing to invest in upgraded infrastructure and LMSs that can actually deliver personalised and fully online learning capabilities. I'm really excited, you know, we're seeing things like online parent-teacher interviews happening, mobile phone use for students, and the fact that live streaming of school events has gone mainstream. I've got to admit one of the highlights for me is that teachers and students are learning to be comfortable in front of a camera. Um, I have flagged this many years ago that moving content online, teachers would have to get used to recording themselves. And I even at one stage tried to build it into our recruitment process that every teacher would need to submit a video as part of their application process, just like our 15 year old students are doing when they're applying for part time jobs. So I see that as a really excellent opportunity for those teachers to learn alongside students. Educators globally have all responded with amazing agility and have absolutely risen to the challenges set before them. But at the same time, we must ensure we don't lose what we've gained. So parents are enjoying a new sense of connection too, and students are enjoying their newfound autonomy. It's like our priorities have now been reset and we need to build on what we have. I can guarantee you in the next 12 months, we'll finally see more schools investing in new roles such as UX and um, which is user, user experience designers and Alex learning designers to help support the shift from emergency remote learning to truly personalised, blended and online models of learning. So as Caroline said at the start, there's always a silver lining and new opportunities do arise from any disruption. And this pandemic, I hope, will be the game changer that we are all looking for. I'll hand over to Lauren. Thank you, Mary Lou. I'm going to start from a background of disruption that I used to work in. So. Um, because disruption changes things and it's not always a pandemic. So previous to my role at Halebury, I was Director of Teaching and Learning at the Royal Children's Hospital Education Institute. So here is an area where 2,500 to 3,500 students a year were disrupted due to illness and had to learn remotely. And they had to have a personalised opportunity and the teaching had to come to their bedside so not necessarily to their house as currently it is, but to their bedside, which also brought unique challenges that were part of this. One of the things that was done in response to that, and I think it's an incredible one that might, I'm gonna put it as a provocation to people at the moment in terms of where it was, was we made a bold decision as an education institute at the hospital that it was going to be 100% opt-in learning. So that if you did not want to come to class, 
We were not a registered school. It was not a government. We were an education institute. What I can say is over 95% of children every day with medical conditions such as cystic fibrosis, advanced, ca advanced cancer, even students that were in palliative care, got up every morning, opted into learning every single day of the week. And that was because our teachers did exactly what Mary Lou spoke about. They crafted immersive and engaging learning experience every day. Our kids got a menu, an actual menu that they got to choose from of different project-based learning that we then linked back to the curriculum goals that the schools gave. And I think in terms of a provocation, how would your school go about offering a menu of learning to students that linked back to curriculum goals? Because that was what we did. And I think it's this emerging um, role that will be there. So our teachers worked in hospitals all around and what they were, which was a term that up until six months ago, I think was never heard of, of learning architect or learning architecture, of, but the ability to design a learning experience that achieves curriculum outcomes, engagement, immersion, opt-in, and sits there and is actually a blended process that doesn't require you always to be in the one spot or in the one country and is something that is developed for you or for a group of people that are choosing to opt in. And previously, we've never had this role. And I think in future roles, as we go through, I agree with what Mary Lou said, it is something that we will have to look at. And I think I always challenge myself in my lessons, and I can, I will put my cards on the table. Sometimes this provocation works well, other days it doesn't. But if the kids didn't have to come to my class today, would they have come? Mm -hmm. And some days I say, yes, of course they would. And some days they do and they're there and our conversations go over time. And other days I can honestly say, no, they wouldn't. But I think that rhetoric of what is school and that you have to go and it does all of these things is starting to be broken down and that concept of video interviews and how that works and how technology disrupts will be there because I would challenge that the current status quo that we have where a student has to go to the following schools really in Australia. So you can go to your local state school and it's usually zoned so you can't you don't have a huge amount of choice in that. You could go to an elite school, a so-called very high fee paying school, and then you're able to go wherever, or you could go to a religious school as well. So they're the choices that we currently have. But what we're starting to see is, so, and um, avenues online are starting to, other schools are as well, where what if I wanted to go to school in Singapore, or what if I wanted to do go to school at Green School Bali online, or where would I be able to? And I think one of these things is great education does not know a geographical boundary. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is something that we need to start to look at. And we need to make sure when we speak about what blended learning is, and it's something that I work with our teachers on, and it's a hard one, is, is this truly blended or is this just technology enhanced? And that's a hard question for teachers of, are we just replicating our pen and paper test and now putting it on a learning management system and making it online and calling it blended? And or are we suddenly creating our video lectures that used to be our face-to-face -face lectures and is that blended? Or are we really looking at what kids do? And the way to do that is to include them early in the design process. And this is why at Halebury we are training our staff in agile learning design and the concepts of agile of releasing early and releasing to the customer and the customer is our students and making sure that they're part of it and to make sure that those rich conversations that we have with students happen before we actually deliver the course and it's such an interesting thing in software development there are really two models there's what's called waterfall and there is this other way called Agile, and I'm really simplifying it in the bits of time. But Waterfall is 
the way our curriculum has been designed for 100 years where we get our outcomes, we get our assessment, we usually design our assessment before we design the learning activities. Mm -hmm. um, and then we design our learning activities, we sit together, we, we cross check it with our teachers, then we deliver it. And if we're lucky, if we're lucky, we'll ask the students whether they liked it at the end of the six months. Now, if I, I, I suppose I'm going to pass on to Stephen because I think that's a good prompt of, is that the best way for us to deliver or can we do better? Yeah, uh, to me, I think of it as what are we blending? Too often it's uh, you're blending boring with technology and that's <laughs> what you get is what often we call blended learning. Um, yeah, I mean, just to foreshadow our discussion, I guess it's sort of we sort of for, put put at the forefront that we are uh, we are privileged and we are, don't know what happened there, uh, we foreshadow, I guess, our privilege and the kind of the complexities that exist with the digital divide and the the traditional divide that, you know, Indigenous students are three, three years behind on average um, and things like that. So we're putting those to one side for a little bit, I guess, just to discuss the way things could be and to take an optimistic lens. Uh, and so as a result, I'll I'll hold back on any, you know, references to things that haven't worked too well, as um, Lauren was driving towards at points there. Um, I mean, yeah, the um, to pull on Lauren's idea, the kind of the idea of if students didn't have to come uh, or it wasn't essential or they weren't, you know, legally bound has always been something that I dabbled with and thought about. And then remote learning is very much that. And so it's been really interesting just to blow my own horn at, at this point uh, Friday Friday afternoon the class finished at 3.22 and at 4.10 we were all just sitting there talking on a Friday afternoon mm -hmm. um, and I think a big part of that is uh, just kind of to me what I've learned from remote learning is that teachers too often have kind of like their teacher teacher voice or their teacher mode uh, and it's very you know Hey guys, how are we all doing? Yep, good, great. Yep, we've had our social interaction. And now we're talking about this and we're very boring and we're very staid and very locked into, you know, traditional views of teaching as dictatorial and one directional, uh, not the band, but the uh, orientation. Uh, and so to me, that's that's been my biggest learning from remote learning. Just uh, it, it's almost seamless, my my identity as a teacher and my identity as a human. And so then when the class finishes and I says, and I say, the class is finished, you're free to go. And they still hang around. And we have a chat on life and topics. That's a big part of it. Um, totally agree with Mary Lou. My big thing is always instructional video. So if you've ever seen me anywhere, it's probably talking about that or delivering on that. And so originally I thought, well, that's really important as a learning artifact because it's superior cognitively and all those sort of things. Um, but what remote learning has shown my colleagues, at least, is that it's a way to improve their presentation because they can see themselves, they can hear themselves, they have to watch themselves back. And they start to realize the amount of teachers that I've spoken to have said, oh, I didn't know I could talk for 40 minutes um, until one of my students pointed it out to me and said, Miss or Sir, you've been, been going for 40 minutes. So, I don't know, to me, um, the revolution's already happened. The teachers have changed. Uh, and so what we're talking about here is kind of how do you change the structures of schools to free up the students, as Adriano pointed out, and give them voice, as did Lauren, give them choice, voice and agency over their learning. Uh, but to do that, we need to free up the teachers first and foremost. And so that's where the activism comes in, because I think the amount of time we spend teaching face to face in Australia is well above the OECD average and world leading. Absolutely. And so while all of our teachers have learned how to do these amazing things, if you then send them back into class for the same amount of time, they will be unlikely to have the energy or the time left to do the kind of things that, you know, the panel that we have here advocate for, learning design, user experience, agency, all those things. So that is my overview. Free the teachers to free the students to allow these amazing things that have happened in a very short amount of time. Not to call it a pivot, but it's very quickly happened and a lot of learning's taken place. And all that we need is a bit of freedom for our teachers and for our schools, maybe a bit of a laxing of the structure that's in place that keeps us pinned to where we are. And uh, I'll throw it back to you, Carolyn. Uh, that ties in very well, actually. Mary Lou, 
um, sent a question earlier today that she had got from um, someone on LinkedIn and it is around this. The question has different parts. First, have teachers been adequately trained in online learning, virtual teacher pedagogy to fully transfer the benefits to the learners? If no, are we missing an opportunity here? And if yes, then what is the standard that we're evaluating their online pedagogy against? And I will throw that to Mary Lou. Well, I'm absolutely saying no to this one. I'm um, going to jump in after <laughs> Mary Lou because I've okay. got my opinions on this one. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say we are definitely missing an opportunity because I think teachers need to be taught online pedagogical practices. And I can assure you they aren't receiving that training in teacher training courses yet and they should have been for at least the last five years or more. So I've come from the higher ed sector where we started moving courses online in the early 2000s, and yet this hasn't seemed to filter down generally until now. So how can we prepare students for further education if they're not experiencing online at school? Um, in 2012, one of the drivers for us uh, at my last school to move the online, well, the senior year's curriculum online was the impetus uh, that we saw in the US where states were mandating that every student must complete an online unit before graduating high school to prepare them for entry to university. So around that time too, um, I think she might be listening in actually, um, I brought in an instructional designer, probably about Oh, six, seven years ago, I suppose now, who built the templates for us and then supported teachers in building their pages in the learning management system that we had. So I'm happy to share an article um, that I wrote some time ago about this that also has an excellent MOOC that people can do, very short course from Deakin University that I would highly recommend um, about online pedagogy. And I, I think it would every teacher would benefit from it, actually. I think <laughs> um, I, I've got a privileged department and I, it's part of the digital divide that often doesn't get spoken about that I want to talk about. So I'll, I'll talk quickly about my role and how privileged I am and how I know that there are not many schools that have a department like this. So I'm director of digital learning. I don't work in the IT team. My whole role as part of the teaching and learning team is to drive online and blended pedagogies across the school. And it's not just me by myself. So I, I, I lead a team and in my team is a junior school digital learning leader with a very, very minimal teaching load a middle school digital learning leader, again, with a very minimal teaching load, a senior school digital learning leader, an instructional designer in every senior school department as a position of responsibility with a, with a, with a payment and a time allowance. Now, we've built this over five years at our school in terms of the support because we knew that blended and online and also working in a complex multi-campus was essential. And this has made the move for us a lot less jolting for our staff because we run every week prior to the pandemic and through we ramped up more, but over nine professional learning sessions outside of ours as well as drop-in and in-class and in-person one-on-one and small group coaching in the digital space. Now, this is an investment not many schools have and it is a luxury that we have where we get to work with teachers we map out what their goals are and where they're wanting to head and i think we have these hard discussions that i spoke about before of is that tech enhanced or is it blended and we've looked to experts again in the us so we used the work of heather staker um, and the book blended um, which i encourage everybody to have a look at in terms of what models fit best in what areas of schooling in terms of blended learning, but also really looking at what that's done for us as a school. And um, even before this, I've, I've worked in the Department of Education in the digital learning branch. And remember, 
when interactive whiteboards were first brought out and as part of a, a gap initiative and our advice at that stage was this is going to be useless if you do not match dollar for dollar your hardware spend with your pedagogical coaching spend mm. that was the advice that we gave and i don't have to tell anyone that knows what happened with the white elephant of technology that happened in that area that 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 didn't happen and i think what we need to look at is how are we matching our technological infrastructure with our human infrastructure because you can't have one without the other in this space. I, I, I want to uh, just jump in here. I don't want to get too derailed uh, and focus on, on um, the staffing conversation, although it is, I believe, extremely relevant to this, to this particular topic. I do want to talk a little bit more uh, about the actual learning context. However, I'll say this. I think it's really dangerous if we go down a path of talking in absolutes. If we if we answer to that particular question and out and out no, that might not then uh, identify that there are some sectors and some schools who actually have been leading in this space, and and who have invested heavily into this particular dimension of their teachers' growth. Not just from a from an understanding of the software and the hardware, but from a, a true pedagogical context. But I want to just uh, expand and take issue with something that, not, not issue, sorry, that's the wrong language. I want, to, I want to expand on something that Stephen just mentioned before, and that was centred around this notion of time. Frankly, I'm sick and tired of talking about time, not from the context that teachers don't have it, but from the context of the fact that we have this industrial model that is wedded to a timetable, and that every time we have a conversation about anything about change in a school, it's, well, can we graft it onto a timetable? Where's it going to fit in the timetable? What's going to give it a timetable? Well, if our, if our whole, if our mission is to transform learning, and if, if some of our desired outcomes is that we want young people of character, we want young people of highly competence, the competency in terms of knowledge and skills, and of course we want their wellness to be one that is rich and deep around their physical and mental health. If they are some of our desired outcomes, then perhaps what we should be doing with our time is saying, the effing timetable is bloody useless. We should abandon the whole thing and we should start again and, and we should flip the context from being time poor to time rich. And and I suppose, Steve, what you were getting at in many ways is how can we actually honour the adults? 85% of our wages in a school setting goes towards the adults. In any other industry, that's one of the biggest investments. Yet there are only small pockets of schools who have invested in, in a serious way to transform the actual teacher and learning. In fact, they're just redefining the role of the teacher. It's exactly what Mary Lou said. Those, fra th those, those titles that you used a moment ago, Mary Lou, they're just not experts in the area of design. They're actually phrases now for some of your most dynamic teachers who, who have adopted in, in this paradigm for a long time. And my challenge really is to all school leaders out there, it doesn't matter what sector it is, and the system as a broader, we've got to stop this binary thinking about the way we structure our timetable. And we've got to introduce a structure that allows the freedom for the powerful teachers, the creative individuals, the people who genuinely care about young people to create time throughout a day to collaborate, to learn, mm. to fail and to trial again, to actually model all the best traits of self-determined learning so they live that experience so that when a young person is encountering it, they can help them and troubleshoot it and navigate through that. And schools with individual learning plans and a personalised program do that. So. We didn't have a timetable at the Children's Hospital because you didn't know who was going to be in every morning, which right. <laughs> is a, a very logical thing. And we would celebrate if they went home. That was a good thing. But every student did have an individual learning plan. And I think where the paradigm needs to change now is that we need to encourage every student to work with their educators to have an individual life plan that stays with them all the way through. And it yeah. changes and, it, and the goals and the timing and how that works changes so that that plan grows all the way through. Because if we don't do this as an education system, there's other disruptors that will be out there in a technological space that will. Yeah, and yeah. what I'm seeing already is players in Netflix, Spotify and other corporations that are going we can offer high quality engaging content in an educational space. Yeah. Come join us. Now, this is where we need to, as educators, make sure that we continue to humanise the technology because 
that we're never going to out tech the tech giants. Mm -hmm. I'd love to jump in there if you'll have me. I mean, yeah, the kind of the, as since we're talking about leading remotely, what happened for teachers is like a real cohesion of teachers online, reaching out, getting support, kind of intermeshing. Uh, but that it, it kind of at a global level, you have to sort of admit that at the same time, uh, you know, some of the big players that Lauren just mentioned, you know, Microsoft, Google, and a whole bunch of other ones that you've never heard of, but you probably should have, uh, were doing just the same thing. So forming really big conglomerations uh, with essentially, you know, intentions of capturing the eyeballs and the attention of our students, of our young people, of our adults. Uh, and our job as teachers is to sort of push back on that to a certain extent to say we are the humans and the human element is important, whether it's face to face or remote. Uh, because it's really easy to see uh, for people to think, well, you know, learning can be done remotely. Um, maybe if we cut down our staffing, got rid of some of those, you know, I mean, we'll keep the digital experts around, but some of the older, dare I say it, uh, staff, we could drop those off uh, and we'll, you know, maybe some of our more technically capable teachers will be able to teach four or five classes at once, or we'll just shop them out to one of the big techs to provide a solution instead. Uh, so, yeah, I just second the point that the, the teachers are pretty crucial in this. Uh, and, you know, we have to be keep tech, big tech at arm's length as much as we can, no, we, no, noting that we have almost no power comparatively. But with, so, that but, comes great, with that comes great opportunity. So I just want to quickly talk about the changing face of employment for teachers. So... Um, I don't know if anybody who's on our YouTube is a Latin teacher, but Latin teachers are very hard to come by. Um, they're, it's not the most modern language. Um, and we've recently advertised for a Latin teacher and we've gone through a recruitment process and the best Latin teacher for us, and our Latin is delivered online, um, the best teacher for our Latin is not somebody in Australia who applied. They applied for the job here and they will be our Latin teacher from another country. And what a wonderful opportunity that is in terms of new employment of how this works, because what we have there is a subject matter expert that is able to look at working. And I know Mary Lou, you do work at a school overseas as well. And I think one of the things that this starts to, I would love to be able to, I know some amazing history teachers and how wonderful would it be for students in the US possibly to be able to subscribe and be part of an Australian history unit or those sorts of things. And what I think we will have is some developments of some real deep experts in subject matter that is there because I think, and just to finalise up, what I will say from a coaching perspective, it is experienced teachers of more than 10 years that from a digital coaching perspective, we have the most success with mm -hmm. teachers that have been teaching longer that have an understanding of what good pedagogy and good relationships are pick the tech up in a much more purposeful way and i, I think that that's an interesting thing of i some of the best teachers i've had in my digital coaching career have been teachers very close to retirement that have actually said i'm an old dog i want to learn new tricks mm. it's great I think what's really interesting about this conversation is that in my experience so far, particularly throughout this year, I've been very fortunate to work alongside uh, a number of different schools, both here in, in Australia and also overseas. And uh, what, what I've been able to witness, what, what I'll say is also is that every one of those schools have a, uh, a well-established learning management system. So I appreciate that with people listening to this, that perhaps that hasn't been as mature in their, in their learning context. And that's what I was saying earlier about context. But these schools all have that. Uh, that still didn't mean that they didn't have challenges with this, this move to that particular space. But I wanna, I wanna go past, I wanna move past that a little bit because there's no doubt that we have to invest in our people and we have to invest in them in a way that we're using technology from a pedagogical construct. And as I said off the top of the show, how we deliver learning through, through a remote platform or a digital platform is very different to the way we would do it uh, face to face. We can't just simply migrate and expect 
that a 60 minute direct instruction lesson, which is probably bad teaching anyway, but a whole 60 minute lesson uh, to be replicated and expect young people in, in, from, from all the way from primary school to secondary school to, to be able to, to navigate through that space. What I've been able to witness is school communities, again, locally and globally, be really creative in this paradigm and say, okay, instead of responding to a crisis and managing it, just simply surviving, they've decided to lead through the crisis. One, one of the schools that I was most inspired by, and, and Mary Lou knows, knows the principal uh, very, very well, and that, of course, is Havergill College in Canada. What I was able to witness very firsthand was because they didn't lose sight of the mission of their school, which is a human-centred learning ecosystem, what they said was they were our guiding principles. How can we ensure that those guiding principles and the wellness of every young person and every teacher is actually catered for in a paradigm that supports this shift that is frightening, that is scary, that's creating anxiety, and that is foreign to so many people. But they took a risk. But it, was, it wasn't a risk as in a negative risk. They actually, because they stuck fat to their mission, it was always going to be successful. Was it 100% perfect? Absolutely not. Is today's learning 100% perfect? It's not. And what, what, what I saw from that was a lot of schools considering this notion of a synchronous approach, a, a well-being uh, infrastructure heavily, heavily built within the framework for the adults as well as the kids, and then an asynchronous one that empowered both the adult and the student to start uh, creating and going off. Mm. They've seen that flourish. Closer to home, I can give you another example for those people listening. Uh, I've, I've, I've had lots of dialogue with Kilbreda College in, in Mentone, and they are a school that adopted a very similar framework around this notion of um, synchronous, asynchronous, and also wellness. Again, they stuck to their values. They stuck to what their core mission is. What is their desired outcome that they want to help these young women with? And their, their survey data is clearly showing that young women were saying, we feel trusted, we feel empowered, we feel, uh, we feel capable, and thank you for allowing us this. And in fact, what they did was when they returned back to school, they actually continued with that model. Mm. So they're actually saying this whole thing about time, we're, we're, we're reimagining it. There's no more binary thinking around time. We are saying that the structure of a day can be very different because our focus is on personalising the learning for each individual student. And there are many, many more examples of that. But the key to it is what these three people that are in this chat do and do exceptionally well. And that is to create learning artefacts and learning opportunities that actually are highly personalised that allows a, a, a young a class of 25, everyone's on an all different cognitive ability to access the learning, to cater for their particular need and for them to flourish. And you couldn't get three better experts than these guys here who, who have actually lived through that process and continue to be huge advocates for it. So I'm just wondering from you guys, what, what are some of the perhaps things that you could share with our listeners about some practices that could really they could really adopt in this kind of remote learning platform to keep the pedagogy at the center and, and, and the human at the center. I, um, I just to jump in, um, may, many of you know that Catherine is monitoring this. Catherine is the, um, got the gig as the head of ACS education. So she's spent the last two years preparing um, lessons and things for teachers on exactly this, um, keeping the pedagogy at the centre of the um, technology. Um, and I know she's speaking on that at an event tomorrow. Uh, we've had a question from the, um, from the uh, YouTube. Um, do you want to carry on there, uh, Adriano, or? Yeah, I, I just saw that question there um, from Phil Kame. Uh, can you all see that question? No. Okay, I'll, I'll read the question. The question is, I think the purpose of on-site learning needs to be redrafted by schools from this pandemic. Should face-to-face -face teaching slash learning be more about character competency and development? I know from my particular perspective, um, the notion of character apprenticeship with a teacher still has a place. Mm. And I also believe that the social exchange that occurs on campus or in context uh, has real value in empowering young people, particularly the schools that I've been with where they have strong arts cultures and strong sporting cultures. There's all those other things uh, that, that young people benefit from when they're participating in those kind of group activities. 
uh, I, I feel that I feel that that's where real magic happens, where young people can start fostering relationships, how to, how to be more accepting of others, develop all those necessary kind of life skills, uh, often called soft skills, to be able to thrive going forward. But I'm going to stop talking. I think the interesting bit there, and people will know I don't always take myself too seriously, I will quote the great expertise of an old El Paso commercial and say, why not have both? And because yeah. I think in terms of how this works, some students thrive during this time and they absolutely have loved working online. A lot of the girls I've worked with say, oh, I can concentrate a lot more and I've got my own space and I can do this. But there are other bits and I think we have, that's a question that has to go back and I challenge everyone to go back and ask the students of what aspects do they want. I'm not, I don't want to be arrogant and say this is where I think these bits should be. I think our students are best placed to tell us what bits, but I also think there needs to be choice. The same as, as a teacher or as a professional, I attend some things online and I attend some things face to face and there are differences in the way that I learn, why don't we have that offering for students as well, where they can choose to have some online, some face-to-face, -face, some different areas. I might do a masterclass with someone overseas and how that works. But why can't we build an ecosystem that does that? And I think the challenge for Australia is why can't we build some of that that is cross-sectoral? Um, so that it's not just for your school and your enrollees, but why can't we have some of these things that are part of it? And I think part of that also is putting some faith in our and putting some of it to our public broadcasters. Um, the ABC have broadcasted through this period an educational program and I think some of that would be wonderful to continue in this space of being able to have that because some students, uh, we've been offering opt-in every night. We're running an at-home at Halebury with guest lectures. I was amazed last night to see a whole group of seven, eight, nine-year-olds sitting in to a VCE level lecture on evolution in the last 5,000 years. Now, that wasn't an either or. That was, oh, if you would like to, join in. We sat back and marvelled that our primary kids tuned in and turned off whatever device or game they were wanting. They wanted to be part of it. Give them the choice. Anybody else want to add something in there? Yeah, look, I was thinking as you said that, Lauren, uh, last night I watched a video that had been put out by a school and it was a student filming their day doing remote <laughs> learning. And it absolutely <laughs> horrified me. And I don't know, there were no comments there and I, I didn't dare make one. But this poor child had been in front of his computer remote learning all day and then it got to 3.30 and his class is finished and he said, now I'll take a break and I'm going to start my homework at 4 o'clock. And he was wow. back on to start homework. <laughs> now, you know, yeah, look, I, I think there's a way, way to go for sure. Uh, you mentioned blended learning. I think the biggest thing that is stopping us is time and the timetable. One thing we worked really hard at my last school was to, you know, we'd say the girls were working through their senior year's curriculum online and it was about giving them back time because their school day was 6 a.m. till 8 p.m. And how they we allowed them to choose how the, they um how they worked throughout the day, but also inc incorporated their well-being and their fitness structures, and all those things were built in. Yeah, I mm -hmm. think we've got to be careful of sort of uh, sending schizophrenic messages to our students, where you sort of say, you know, people think culturally in Australia studying is not that important, comparatively, you know, to a, our more eastern countries where there's a, a sort of a whole range of tutoring options available and the day never ends. You go from mm -hmm. tutor, tutor space one to tutor space two and yeah. so on. Uh, but then the messaging around, you know, the way that learning is done at school is very much directed and it happens in blocks of time. Uh, and, you know, we're trying to minimise distractions within those spaces, uh, but we never actually give time for any consolidation. I know 
at my school, the concept of a consolidation lesson that happened once every two weeks during remote learning uh, was very well received by students, um, as you might imagine. Uh, and it's kind of like Adriano was saying, this sort of having students say, have, having them being surprised that they've been trusted to do something for themselves or to have autonomy. I mean, on the one hand, you sort of, you know, you pat yourself on the back and you think, well, we must have done something good there. But the very fact that it's so rare that they have to mention it as though, like, you know, it's a, you know, the skies have gone red and it's a once in a lifetime opportunity. The stars have crossed over Jupiter or something to me is a pretty significant message for us to heed around, you know, maybe we could trust them a little bit more as we have had to in remote learning. And that not only do they respect when we do that, um, but that, that that should be something that they can expect from adults in their life. One other thing I just want to add uh, in response to Phil's question and to compliment what everyone is saying here is that, um, you know, these three individuals are talking powerfully about uh, the gains that can be made in this remote space. But it's not about the remote learning that I'm hearing. What I'm hearing is the gains to be made from personalising the learning and, and what can be done in that context. What, what I've witnessed, um, and I suppose this is to Phil who, who answered the question, what I've witnessed in, in this uh, the schools that have been able to balance the focus on the, their, their desired outcomes and then they're using platforms like remote as well as on campus, as well as in-country experiences, as well as in-context work placement, all that type of stuff. Um, what they have done very, very well is they focused on three fundamental things. One, they built well-being in, as central to their structure, whether that was online or in-person non-negotiable that is for the adults in the community as well of course as the young people in the care the second was they were they were not afraid to mix it up that meant was that they were brave enough to abandon the the, the structure of, and, and the restrictions of what we've become to know a structured timetable whether it's four period five period days and they abandoned that and created a new paradigm that allowed for opportunities for people to be on campus as well as off campus uh, because of people's personal circumstances. Sometimes they needed to be on campus because that was a better, safer environment than perhaps the home. But the third one, and the third one was one that was very pronounced. And that was something what Lauren just said there about what Halberry has done every night. And that was this notion of fostering a sense of community. Mm. And at the, heart, at the heart of really good learning uh, uh, schools is community. Mm. People need people. Mm. Connectedness, to culture, to, to, um, uh, to each other around care. They need to feel it, not just see it, you know? And, uh, and, and so those schools that, that have worked that way. So, so perhaps, you know, if we had an opportunity where all those kind of three different things of mixing up the, the learning structure, looking at the community and having well-being as the common thread, if we can look at ways in which to, to do that effectively in a personalised way for the individuals, but then also have the opportunities to come together collectively mm. because there is something about bringing us together uh, and, and working collaboratively together uh, that that is going to be a reality in some cases for so many people going forward. We have a, uh, we have a couple of questions here. Um, one from Mike Parker. Um, do we think that there, the change in the relationship between the school and the community um, will change when everything's offline, online. Um, how will that relate to schools in the future? I wonder whether that's a, the, the full thing about all of it being online is really um, tied to this pandemic where everything's sort of, um, do you think in the future, how would that school community relationship work? Ours has gotten stronger. Mm. We've seen, so for the first time in a really long time, I think we've parent-teacher interviews, which we spoke about right back at the start, we've seen more members of the family, whether they be mothers, fathers, extended family, being able to attend a parent-teacher interview because they've attended from their workplace. So we've had um, got a great one of one of our teachers who, was part of the parent-teacher interview um, and the parent was in a closet at the hospital on a break <laughs> on their Zoom doing that. But we've had more, more people be part of that because they're part of that community. And I think I would challenge 
the concept of online and offline, I think that's one of the wins in this is that we've got our community in different ways now. And I, I would challenge, I, I would look at how a lot of people and um, have met their significant partners in life. Um, I met my partner 12 years ago on Twitter, as a few people know. Um, <laughs> Yes, um, but I met him on Twitter and we meet significant people online in our life all the time now and online is a significant part of our community. Uh, the people who I'm on this panel with right now are part of my community and I think that this has changed community for the better for schools. But someone can challenge that because that, that's my viewpoint. Mm. Well, you know, just to, comp to just add to that too, you know, Mike, what I've been witnessing in some schools, talking about the relationship between the school and community, what I've been actually witnessing is some creative uh, teachers actually getting in contact with industry leaders or mm. people in various different fields of endeavour and, and inviting them into the Zoom conversation or whatever platform that's being used, Microsoft Teams or whatever it is, um, uh, and, and using them as you know, part of this kind of expertise and sharing a bit of that. And so what's been really interesting is if you think about, if we had to do that on campus, you know that we have to go through a lot of risk assessment, even if we took them off campus as a group, we'd have to go through risk assessment. We've got to look through the costs associated to buses or, or some type of transport. Um, we of course got to make sure that they have a working with children check in today's world, all those type of things. Of course, I still want to be diligent online. I don't want any predators coming into my classroom, but. But in fact, there are so many industries that, that would be far more accessible to them. Because we also have to think about if you've got a guest speaker coming to you, they've got to travel. What time is associated? In this way, you know, they just they just log in when they need to and they can contribute. So I think I think from my point of view is my answer to that question is there is an opportunity to actually scale up the relationship between the school and particularly the business community. Uh, and, and I've also seen some schools successfully do social justice online because they haven't been able to do it in that place and really um, go th to things like um, uh, crowdsourcing for, for funding and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. So they're tapping into the kind of technology and algorithms and, and, and systems that already exist to try and support some of these organisations. But I want it to be clear, I, I, not for one minute do I think it would ever should replace the opportunity to build community in person as well. But I think these are different opportunities. And the, the parent teacher interviews, what a great way to connect. Yeah. Uh, bringing in businesses, what a great way to, to scale that up. And I reckon the more that we could do that, I think we're going to see a greater growth in enterprise thinking in schools and, and the greater opportunity for, for, for me being a facilitator of the learning and bringing in experts from so many different fields to hopefully ignite that passion in a young person to go, gee, I, I never thought about that. That could be a real interest. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm aware of the time here. Um, and there's a question here that obviously is um, dear to my heart. Um, Sarah says, how do we ensure education is accessible and not a growing digital divide? I contrast my children's opportunities here in Melbourne compared to their cousins in Lagos. How do we leave no student behind? I'm happy to jump in, give us some stats because I've written too much about this. Sorry, I can't see you on my screen, Lauren, so I'm just jumping into a gap that's already filled. Um, uh, PISA would tell us 87% uh, of Australian 15-year-olds have one play quiet place to study. Uh, if you think about remote learning, you need a lot more than just one. So that even in and of itself, you think of the remaining percentage, uh, and that's obviously going to be concentrated in certain areas and certain populations. Uh, internet penetration itself is about 88%, I think, in Australia. Uh, and our internet speed, this one always stumps me, but I think it's around 52nd in the world. Someone might be able to correct me on that one, but it ain't so hot. And uh, as I call in from my 4G rather than my NBN, I can add some uh, personal credence to that. Um, but so just in terms of the base statistics, if we consider ourselves a developed country, to use words that we shouldn't, uh, I don't think we can accept that level of basic uh, internet spread and uh, Lauren feel free to jump in my apologies oh no 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 I was throwing to you because you are the expert in this space of, oh. of because no well through teachers without borders teachers across borders and, yeah, yeah. Across borders and no that was what I was doing was throwing oh. to you okay. 
um, yeah, so uh, people may or may not know my other space that I spend most of my holidays or used to until coronavirus uh, is in Cambodia. And so we train teachers there. Uh, and so the difference in digital over there is basically that they've skipped the personal device and jumped straight to mobile. Mm -hmm. And so it's very easy for us from our background to think, oh, well, this must be something missing. Um, but if you, you know, if you just think about mobile learning and the failed uh, research coverage of mobile learning, uh, it's not talked about almost at all anymore. Uh, but that's what they have, and so that's what they use. And they, uh, a lot of my Cambodian colleagues, Khmer colleagues, could come over here and give us uh, quite a kind of lesson in uh, how to use technology ethically because there are concerns around corruption and political uh, constraints. So they're all using end-to-end uh, -end encryption on everything that they do, uh, teaching, learning, all sorts of things, and they're all, while I'm still struggling to get staff uh, everywhere I go to make instructional video, they've set up phones on tripods and they're teaching their students from their homes. Um, and I'm sure that's true way more broadly than my limited experience of Cambodia and Australia. But mm. yeah, so the to think that we're still worrying about the most basic elements of digital learning is pretty problematic, I think, and a bigger conversation than one that we have time for here. But mm. just laying that out as sort of our ground floor as we probably run out of time, I'm guessing. Um, we're on the 6.30 p.m. Um, time. So that is um, the time that we allowed. I, um, I don't suppose anybody's going to get upset if we are over by a minute or two, but I'm very aware of the time that these very, very kind educators have um, given us today. Um, the one thing that I will ask, somebody mentioned a um, a MOOC link. Um, I've already put it up there, Carolyn. Thank you very much. That's awesome. Um, and I'm, I'm sure that, well, certainly from our point of view, if people who have watched this have questions or want to take the um, conversation further, um, we are definitely happy to do so. The... Um, recording of this will be up on the um, DIFF website now and I believe they're leaving it there for a couple of months so people will be able to jump in and um, catch up with what um, has been spoken about today. Um, basically, thank you to everyone. Thank you for our panellists. Um, we appreciate this enormously and thank you for being so kind when I messed up last week and agreeing to do it again. Um, my learning for the week is how to stream videos on YouTube. So that's a new thing I've learnt. And thank you to you, Carolyn. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank my thank pleasure you, Carolyn. being a ball. And um, we'll leave it at that. So I will um, end the stream. And I have ended 